I'm reading your, your questions uh, to start the questions and answers session. Leo, what kind of questions have we been having? Philip, uh, first question, maybe just uh, to, th that was asked, it was, uh, can you explain the difference between bottleneck and constraint? Um, well, there isn't a uh, perfectly official uh, definition that everybody agrees on, I'll give you mine. Uh, and uh, the def definition, if you need to find a difference, right? I mean, quite a few companies don't make the difference. They just have the same two, the two words for the same thing, right? And in that case, they're talking about a resource whose capacity is less than uh, the demand placed upon it, right? It has too much work, all right? Um, and uh, as I said, people can talk about that as a, a bottleneck or a, a capacity constraint. What you can, uh, if that's what's behind the, the question, you can ar argue about this according to whether that resource is being worked uh, available uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and so forth, right, or not. And uh, since you have many resources that are not working like that, they're working less, you've turned them into a, uh, to, to a resource with uh, less capacity, okay? And in, in so doing, you could have what then people will talk of as a, a, a bottleneck. That's to say that, as such, uh, you're, you're using it in the um, in the sense that I've described here as the focal point in your organisation. But in fact, it could produce more uh, just simply by opening up for, for, for weekends and stuff. Okay. But I, I, my apologies that there is no formal. Uh, agreed upon definition between the two that makes the difference. Uh, some description they, they consider is the same word. Philip, next question. At the, at the exploit step of theory of constraints, should I use lean tools to drive in results? Of course, yes. Um, it's, uh, it's more, I would say, in, in, the, um, in the elevate stage, uh, I repeat, exploit for me is what you can do within a day or within a week. So the parts of the lean tools that can have immediate impact, yes, I, I completely agree, right? Um, but if you're talking about some fairly longer term uh, five Y analysis to find the root cause and stuff, which is going to take you uh, a, a week because you're working on a complex problem, uh, that for me is more in the elevate uh, thing. But uh, yes, of course, you use uh, lean tools uh, all, all the time and uh, in the exploit stage. Um, if I take the example of the, there's the second case I presented. Uh, the uh, bottleneck was in quality control, okay? And I think this is something we often, I know it's something we often find. Uh, there is one of the reasons why, by the way, why the, this kind of bottleneck in quality control ap ap appears. It's among other things because there is no data on its capacity. That's to say, people do not like to say uh, that I have that time per part in terms of quality control. You don't want to put pressure on them and have OEEs on the, on the quality control because they meant to have the time to take the decision calmly. Okay, so you don't have a capacity model, which means that that's how the, the bottleneck appeared. And it's not always organized as a factory, as a, a, a quality control factory. And so uh, in that case, and quite often, we just apply some of the basics of lean to the, to the uh, operations of quality control to make sure that you know, they have a good working environment, that the, the, the tools are properly positioned, uh, that uh, there's uh, not, no, no, no waste in, in, in movement, uh, and that they're, they're in perfect working conditions. So we're using a lot of some of the basics of lean in quality control, for instance, uh, to make them uh, more industrial, um, because uh, we find that often they are they are not right uh, because of the silo between quality control and, and operations. Um, so yes, of course. Philip, uh, what is your approach to new constraints created when you resolve a bottleneck? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? What is your approach to the new constraints created when you resolve a bottleneck? It, it, it's, it depends. Um, I, I wish I could give a, a recipe. 
uh, on that one. But frankly, uh, I find uh, that we, we find uh, quite different situations. Okay. Uh, again, you can see this in, in various videos. In one example, we were working on uh, people who made uh, luxury uh, baggage. Uh, and uh, we were in that process trying to identify where the bottleneck is, the 400 people in the factory. The first bottleneck we found was the person who um, inputted the bill of materials uh, for the specific uh, products which were made to order and therefore all required a special buckle, a special this, whatever. That was just one person, uh, quiet, so diligent, been with the company for 30 years, didn't dare uh, make a fuss. Uh, but had five months, five months of work on her list. Um, and when we uh, helped that and got rid of that, uh, it went to another stage, which was purchasing all those same special parts. Okay, Again, bad bottleneck. And we went to a third point, which was a bad bottleneck. And it was only that, uh, nearly a year later, we got to the fourth bottleneck, where it started to make sense. Okay, So there were several bad bottlenecks where we just, when we broke the first bottleneck, the next one would be was silly, so we knew we had to break it and kept going like that. So we got to something that started to make sense, something that was kind of expensive, right? Uh, or, or and as I tried to describe in my, my, my definition. Other times, um, the, the, the bottleneck uh, can be nearly in, in the right position and, and just cleaning up a few things around the bottleneck means that quite quickly you'll, you'll already have the right bottleneck. And in which case, my answer is very different, I repeat. You decide, that's a strategic decision, that this is going to be the constraint in your organization, right? And I'll say it again, because it's not often presented in this way within the theory of constraints. Theory of constraints says you cannot distribute the work equitably, right? It's impossible. Can't do that anymore. Okay? But what you could do to simplify things is to say, this is the resource which is going to be the constraint, and I will maintain in my budgets forever, from now on, excess capacity in front and behind, okay? So if I've got to a point where I think this is the right bottleneck, we're no longer applying the five focusing steps, we're in fact trying to raise the capacity of the bottleneck and the non-bottlenecks in such a way as it remains the constraint. Okay, I'm not sure in the video if you can see me like this, because uh, you can't see my arms, you can see me. Um, and so that that's a, a, a different stage, and, and for me, the, the the second level, the interesting part of the three constraints is that, because you, there's the first question, um, where should my constraint be in the system, and how much excess capacity I should put in the, the, the non-bottleneck parts before or after it, and eventually where it should be in the process, at the beginning of the process, at the end of the process, so it gets to be interesting to, to think about that. So that's. That's what I do in when, when you break a bottleneck. Uh, it's either you know you're a long way from, from uh, uh, having a, a, an interesting bottleneck, and it's just one regrettable bottleneck after another, and just quickly uh, go through them until you get to, to some, some something that looks like a potentially uh, good bottleneck or not ridiculous bottleneck. The next question, Philip. I had several questions that I. I compiled into one. Uh, yeah. Can you please elaborate on how you go about setting work in progress limits for different stages of workflow and how to control the buffer volume? A level of uh, inventory between two work stages, right, is zero. That's why, it's, for me, uh, lean and theory constraints are saying exactly the same thing, right? I want there to be zero work inventory between this resource and this resource. Can you see my mouse? Between the first and the second machine. I want zero inventory between the second and the third. I want zero inventory between that one and that one and that one and that one. Okay. That is what I've set as a target. Zero. Why? Because in the old world, the reason why we decided to have inventory is to protect one machine against the problems of another, right? You didn't want this machine to, to have to stop as soon as this one had a problem. So you put inventory everywhere so that you would separate the machines one from the other. But if you now accept that anyway, they will be work, they will stop working because they are not bottlenecks. You don't need to protect them anymore, right? It's not a, not a big deal if they stop working. If they stop working because they don't have enough work, that is not a problem because they have excess capacity. When work arrives, they'll catch up. They have excess capacity. Okay? So the target level of inventory 
in all the 90% of the factory where their non-bottlenecks, the target is zero. These people, their job becomes uh, speedy Gonzales, right? You, they, they just, as soon as a batch arrives, they want to move it on, move it on, move it on as quickly as possible. And it's the same down here. Yeah. There are only two exceptions in this, in this model. Uh, you will have uh, a buffer of a certain size here and a buffer of a certain size there, right? So, second part of the question, how big is this buffer, right? Forget any kind of calculations, please. You cannot calculate the size of this buffer at all uh, because the, you'd have to model uh, all the uncertainties and problems that uh, you would have in your environment. You can't get the data. If even if you got the data, the mathematics would be hairy. Okay, don't waste time doing that, right? Just guess, okay? And... Uh, the, the simple model uh, to, to start with is to assume that by changing the logic from what you're using before to drum buffer rope, you can probably reduce the lead times by about half. Okay, so uh, let's take this as an example. Let's assume that the, the, the system had previously four weeks of lead time. Okay, and you want to implement drum buffer rope. You would therefore aim to have two weeks of lead time in the future. Okay, and uh, you want to have basically a nearly zero inventory and, and infinite speed in these non-bottlenecks and then buffers, right? So if your bottleneck is in the middle, as it is in this diagram, you would have about a one-week buffer here and a one-week buffer there, okay? I repeat, you start off with four weeks, cut it in two, that's two weeks, and then you have two buffers So you, in this simple system where the bottleneck is in the middle, you would have two weeks, uh, you would have one week here and one week there. Okay, now why have I done that so quickly just by looking out the window and guessing? It doesn't matter. The point is not to try and guess the right size of buffer, nobody can, and that doesn't really matter at all because then what you do is you start the process of ongoing improvement to adjust the size of the buffers to what the company actually needs, and that will be easy. Because what you will do is you will monitor what the buffers actually contain, right? And uh, you will see whether they are too full or too empty, right? Let's assume that we've done what I just said. You have a one-week planned buffer here, okay? You run the company for a month and you take photos of this every morning or whatever. And you find that this buffer is nearly always full or it had always three days of inventory at least, okay? So it was set up for seven, but because of the problems here, it only had three. Right? Well, we know we can reduce the, that buffer by at least at one day, if not two. Okay, so you do that and you run the system again and you keep adjusting this size um, until you get it right. And then you do the same down here, right? So guess at the beginning, and I can say it like this as simply as I said it, because I, we've done it many, many, many times. Everybody starts with a buffer that's too big. Um, and so you, you haven't broken anything, right? And then little by little, or quite fast at the beginning, but then little by little, you can reduce the size of the buffer. So you cannot calculate the size other than that very simplistic rule I gave you, um, which is to, to imagine that your future system has about a cycle time of reduced by 50% compared to what it was before, and these two buffers, right? And to reduce it further, just to be completely, you, you, you want to, to, to then use buffer analysis to decide where you should be doing further improvements in the system, right? So you try to find the root cause of the deep penetrations of this buffer to try and work out which of these resources or whatever is happening up here, which most often leads to uh, uh, late arrival in the buffer, right? And you focus on those, and you're focusing on those, and your buffer ends up getting more and more full. And once again, you can reduce its size because you've dealt with the root causes for which it was protecting the system. And you carry on and carry on and carry on. I repeat, what people don't understand sometimes about the theory of constraints is this, what you're looking at, is so powerful, right? That it can get very good performance out of a very bad factory, okay? You can get good throughput, your bottleneck's working all the time, Okay, and because you schedule it correctly, you, you've got pretty good lead times, especially as your lead times are protected by another buffer, right? So you've got very good due date performance, you've got good throughput, 
and you could fall asleep. Right? That's why the fear constraints and lean both agree, because Taishi Ono wouldn't like that way of doing things because he would consider he, he needs to keep more pressure on the people. And so his what he was doing, in fact, was taking out Kanban cards out of the Kanban groups. It's the same idea that Eddie Goldrat would say. Don't fall asleep on your buffers. Try and keep minimizing, right? Reduce your inventory, reduce your inventory. They're both trying to get to the same destination. They just have a different logic to get there. Okay. So, coming back to the very good and important question the target levels of inventory in non bottlenecks is zero. The only two places where you want to have inventory is to protect the bottleneck and to protect your finished goods, your, or your due date performance. And uh, that size of those buffers just guess uh, and then the, 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 once you've done that look if it's too big or too small nearly everybody makes it too big at the beginning and then you start re reducing it I hope that answers the question Philip uh, you were talking about the uncertain environment and in the new reality of COVID-19 demand influx is it possible to keep doing just in time Uh, yes, you can continue doing just in time. Uh, if by that you mean to what extent did we not protect uh, the economy, the supply chains correctly by having too little inventory in various places? Yes, uh, but that's a much larger question. I mean, we we're, we're all acting in a very panicked fashion as if this was an extraordinary event. When in fact it was the third respiratory disease uh, alert in the past uh, 10 years so we knew it was coming uh, we should have thought about this a long time ago um, people like bill gates had said so and and maybe the next time it'll be even worse and i'm not even sure that even though we've basically put the world economy on our knees doing what we've just done i'm not even certain that we will take the lessons of this and uh, shorten the supply chains as people are saying relocalize as people are saying and stuff we didn't learn the last two times. I'm not quite sure why we'll learn this time. Um, so, uh, sorry if that goes a bit away from the theory of constraints, but um, uh, the just in time within a factory, right, where you're trying to reduce inventory and keep it to a strict minimum is a must, whether it's COVID or not COVID or whatever happens, right? That was the beautiful insight of Taishi Ono. If you can get your factory to run with very, very little inventory in the system by getting rid of all the, all the things that are going wrong, then you're going to make more money and everything's going to go beautifully, okay? So having flow, things flow quickly through the factory, don't change whether COVID or not COVID, right? To protect your factory against raw material supplies and all the external supply chain problems, yes, you should buffer yourself. That should have already been done by simple risk management, right? Um, and uh, so that's the, the, the solution. But let's also be clear, given the level, and we, we haven't even really started to see the supply chain impact of COVID, right? We've been talking about just masks and stuff, but container ships have not been leaving Asia for, as they used to for, uh, since the beginning of the confinement in China. Uh, the oceans are empty of the container ships that used to come to Europe and America to feed the factories. And uh, it's now we're going to have some interesting problems in all sorts of other businesses, not the masks, the gels, and so forth. Uh, Philip, how does managing the system differ when the bottleneck constraints is at the start of the process or at the end of the process? <laughs> okay, good one. Um, well, firstly, uh, again, this is a very simplistic rule, and there are exceptions. The logo of the company is as it is because uh, bottlenecks are often in the middle. Okay, and this is kind of anecdotal, but it's also quite true. Why are bottlenecks often in the middle of the organization? It's because if they were at the beginning, if it was the first operation, all the resources in the company would have trouble meeting their local OEE targets, keeping busy when the boss uh, came by. Okay, so it's very rarely the gating operation that is a true capacity bottleneck, right? I repeat, if it was the first operation, everybody would have too much problems trying to look busy when the boss came. Okay, so it's not often there, right? Uh, and why is it never at the end? Uh, for a different reason, since a lot of people have to do heroic efforts uh, to uh, obtain good uh, due date performance rather than having a robust uh, flow management system, 
right? They need to be able to panic uh, and expedite things at the end. And so you'll find, for instance, in packaging operations, people have sometimes four times the, uh, the, the capacity they need, the monthly capacity they need, so that they can panic and uh, meet that, uh, fill that truck and all that stuff. Uh, and this is even worse if you're in one of these companies that has end of month phenomena, where a lot of your sales and exp exp uh, what you expedite um, comes out uh, in the last week of the month, in which case you'll need even more excess capacity at the end there to do your, your flushing out. Uh, by the way, that's very bad news if you've got an end of month phenomena, you've got a long way to go before you become lean or efficient, right? It's just complete madness, a conflict between local uh, efficiencies and, and the global performance. Uh, there was a second, oh yeah, um, and um, what happens if it's the beginning of the end? Okay. Um, but that's the, 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 the quick answer. And uh, there are now uh, quite a few organizations where it's at the end, okay, which is probably one of the worst places for it to be. You have no flexibility with regards to uh, fluctuations in demand. <coughs> You'll have a lot more trouble controlling the, the rope, right? Making sure people don't launch more into the system than they can cope with. And the best example of that, because it seems to be really universal throughout the world, or 95% of, of that business, is IT, IT development, right? So, uh, developing software and stuff like that, where uh, very, very, very often uh, the bottleneck is in testing, right? The last operation. And, uh, well, it's just as bad as having it in quality control, it should never be there. It leads to uh, releasing software that uh, hasn't been properly tested under the pressure of getting things finished. Um, and everybody piles up the stuff in the system, gets into full multitasking, and um, it goes mad. Um, finally, still on this question of where the bottleneck could be uh, and should be, Normally, you want it to not be too close to the uh, final client if you're in a business to consumer uh, activity um, because uh, th there won't be any flexibility, right? Um, and uh, therefore, you probably want it to be further up your supply chain so that you can more often be working on uh, maybe forecasted demand or whatever and, and anticipate fluctuations and find some demand, right? And finally, there's a limit to, to what I can go through in, 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 in such a short time, but I'll just open up the, 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 the topic of something which uh, uh, I didn't manage here because we're talking about production. But what if you're, uh, in fact, a services company, a production, but a services company, right? I'll give you an example we are discussing yesterday with, with, with someone. They do um, uh, non-destructive te testing for uh, the aeronautics industry because the aeronautics industry is in a mess, all the stuff that arrives to be tested is uh, to be finished yesterday, right? It's all urgent, all urgent, all urgent. Okay, so they, to, 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 to honor the speed that is required by the uh, aeronautics companies, they have to have excess capacity, right? Uh, if you have a bottleneck, you're talking about queues, right? And so if you want to be good service uh, with a fluctuating uncertain demand, you need excess capacity. And it's the same thing for the fast food industry, which uh, we, we worked in, right? You do not uh, expect to have a capacity bottleneck in a fast food restaurant, because otherwise <coughs> you'll get a queue of customers waiting for the bottleneck to take care of you, right? And they would go all square. So you will, in fact, when you're applying that theory of constraints in that environment, you will aim to have excess average capacity you would choose the bottleneck as a control point as i say that's why the ambiguous answer with regards to bottleneck and constraints right you will have a control point in the system which will only become a bottleneck a few minutes in the rush right you have a two-hour rush excess capacity for the two-hour rush but uh, two, uh, three occasions for 10 minutes there was a bus that came in or whatever uh, you had a wave of work and it became a bottleneck for a few minutes if you choose your bottleneck like that, you'll keep maintaining the flow stable. You won't go into panic mode, and that's how you should do it. So you can't, this is, sorry, maybe I shouldn't have done this because it will confuse some people. This is the theory of constraints with no constraints, right? Uh, as such, I repeat, in a, a fast food restaurant, you have excess capacity for the entire rush, so you don't have a constraint as such.
you can apply, we have applied the theo constraints to that type of organization because you need to have a, a, a point from which you manage flow, a focal point from which you manage flow with, with the rope system and stuff, even though it will only become a bottleneck, more demand than it can actually do for a few minutes within that rush. Okay, I mentioned that example because there are quite a few companies that are in fact as much a service company than a production company, right? Uh, they, they have to uh, react very fast to uncertain demand, and that means that they have to maintain excess capacity. Doesn't mean they don't do theory constraints. They manage it as I've just described. And Philip, maybe one last question. It seems to me that people tend to automatically implement theory of constraint directly in production without looking where the constraint really is, sales customers. Where should we start looking for constraints? Production or organization? Uh, oh, difficult to give a short answer on that one. Um, there's a, I don't know if this is the underlying point in, in the question. There is uh, certain presentations of the fear constraints. Talk about the types of constraints and we'll mention things like a management attention constraint uh, uh, and that sort of thing. Which is, it's true or false. I don't usually use that vocabulary because I don't think it's the right way of uh, defining constraints. So I don't uh, consider management attention as being a potential constraint. Um, for me, a constraint is something where you can apply the five focusing steps that I presented, right? And you can't do that to management attention. But it's, it, why does the, why does the confusion exist? I think mean, it's quite simple. Ultimately, uh, the, 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 the constraint is uh, management attention or, or management time multiplied by its capacity to, to take decisions, uh, how good it is at taking good or bad decisions. Okay? And this can be uh, explained in a very, very simple way, right? If, as we have on this page, there is a bottleneck resource there, right, the red thing, that was the result of a management decision that was not taken properly five years ago. Well, that sort of thing, right? So, of course, ultimately, the, the, the root cause of what you're looking at is in the management's hands, right? So they're, they're responsible for everything we see. Um, and so that, 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 that's true. I repeat, I don't manage it as a constraint, but as a problem to be resolved. Right? And we would, obviously, uh, especially me within our organization, I spend a lot of my time with my, my bloodstained cricket bat talking to, to top management uh, because uh, they, 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 they must improve a number of things, both the cultural change that I talked about today uh, and many other things. Okay, so um, that's my first point. The, the second point, which I, I often find is, is hidden behind that question, is the following. Uh, it's people who come to me saying, I love the goal, it's fantastic, I wish I could implement it, but my boss is too stupid, okay, and therefore I won't. Um, uh, you know, it's reformulating the thing that the, the, the problem in my factory is not the machines, it's management retention. I have a, a boss who does not deserve his salary, okay. And, and frankly, uh, my answer is always the same on that one. Please do not wait to have good bosses that deserve their salaries because you're going to wait a long time. Okay, uh, that's an exception. If you get an alignment of planets, maybe it will happen to some of you uh, one day in your for a few day, years in your life. Right? It's not the norm, right? We're we're we're, we're humans, and uh, the, the management uh, efficiency, leadership, and so forth is always improvable. Sometimes largely so. Okay, so. If you're in such a situation, don't wait to have the right bosses because it'll never happen. Do it anyway, okay? And I can say this calmly because we do a lot of training like uh, in our company. We train over people, people who will often never see again, right? They, they come for a one day, two day course on period constraints. They get the knowledge and I tell them this and I ask them to do it. And the, the result is very often very, very nice for them, their career and their company. That's to say, they will go off and do it in their, in their little part of their factory, right? Because they're, they're not the boss. Uh, they will get beautiful results. People will come and see how did you do it. It will then get generalized to half the factory, to the whole factory, from the factory to a division, from the division to the entire factory. Okay. Uh, many of the logos you saw there, that, that's what happened. People started in a little corner, right? And truly, that's what I encourage you to do because. We're talking about, uh, let's be clear, a marginal 
approach used by very few people compared to lean. You're going to have to dare to say, I'm not just doing lean, right? And today, nobody can say, I don't do lean, or only 1% of the organizations in the world dare say that sort of thing, right? You, it's uh, accept that you must be doing lean. You do it well, you do it badly, that's another subject. Um, but you have to do lean. So if you come with a thing like this, you, you're, you're daring to use something different. Don't expect open arms from everybody. Everybody hasn't read the book, the goal. Uh, but start by just getting results by the kind of things I've showed you. You can get very strange, very rapid results by applying what I've just said. Do it where you are. Do it within your per perimeter. And uh, people will come and, and ask how you did that. And from little by little, uh, you'll get there. Okay. So um, you can see I can't give a, a short answer to that because in many ways that's now become my 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 job in my company my colleagues Leo and others help with the the the, the, the implementations and my my role is to uh have some uh one-to-one -one serious discussions with uh top management to get them to align on behavior on culture on respect for people on ambition and courage ambition i mean it's not the subject for today but um the there's good lean and bad lean, right? Good lean is very rare. It's the Toyota way. There are not many other companies that are doing good lean like that. And it involves continuously increasing sales more than productivity so that you don't reduce headcount, right? That's what Toyota has done. People forget that, right? They think they're doing lean and reducing headcount all the time, which is just a, a way of using Japanese words to uh, reduce headcount, right? The process of ongoing firing using Japanese words, ongoing downsizing. That's bad lean. And it's, the vast majority of uh, what's going on, okay? And the reason we have that is that there's a lack of courage or audacity of entrepreneurship in many organizations. And uh, that, that's the sort of thing we have to fight for. And I find the theory of constraints helps a lot with that because it's got this, this throughput focus. And again, it's why I think they're, they're made for each other leading and theory of constraints. The throughput focus of the theory of constraints, how can I produce more, right? In all these cases, I didn't talk about Cost reductions, I talked about increasing sales, increasing volumes, and increasing global productivity, right? So you have that. The theory of constraints encourages to look like that. And when you do that, by the way, you'll get to these interesting discussions about, oh, uh, I need to improve my marketing and sales because I need new, new more, more business, right? I need uh, new orders. And if at the same time you've intelligently combined it with the lean approach of chasing the mooders and, and getting your, your organization leaner and leaner, with a lot and lot less waste, well then you're, you're hitting things by, by, by both ends, right? You're getting more and more efficient and you're not firing people every time you get more efficient and you build a beautiful story. That's yet another way of saying why those two things, lean and fear constraints are made for each other. It's that uh, you can build a, a fantastic story uh, with those two strong points, right? Lean will get rid of all that extraordinary amount of waste we know we all have in our factories. It's mind boggling sometimes. And the fear constraints will help you guide you in terms of uh, increasing throughput, therefore increasing sales and making sure that you increase your sales more than you increase your productivity every year and so you don't have to fire people because if every time you improve you have to fire people you're not going to get very far briefly. Okay so that's it thank you very much I hope you enjoyed it and uh, to conclude please 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 just go away and do it uh, stop thinking uh, Tomorrow morning, if you go and double check that you've got the right bottleneck, I repeat, you're probably wrong, so think again. The bottleneck, uh, find it, right? And uh, then take, uh, that's step one, and then do step two uh, tomorrow afternoon, please. And uh, please so then write to me, send me a LinkedIn message or whatever saying, yeah, I just did it and it works because it does work. I mean, I'm when a magician, some people say, you know, it's because I've been doing it so long that uh, that's why I, I have so many good results. Uh, it's not true. Leo and my colleagues do nearly all the work in my company now. I'm, I'm getting too old for all this stuff. Okay. So, uh, average age 30, uh, more than half of the women, they're actually doing this stuff. So, don't tell me you have to have 34 years of experience and done it 200 times to get started because you never will if you do that. Right? But just please go away and do it. You'll see it's fun, you see it works, you see it's not complicated. And if you do it uh, in a consensual way, and particularly talking about lean, uh, when I say that, 
Uh, don't try and say theory constraints is better than the that won't work. That's never how we work. Uh, we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't get anywhere if we tried it that way. Try to explain to people how and why they, they they can help each other, and uh, you'll get the kind of results I'm, I'm presenting. That's all we're doing. Uh, we using the theory constraints as I tried to explain, and we're being plural, uh, uh, creating a cocktail of lean theory constraints. And those are the sorts of results we're doing. So just just go away and do it, and don't try and find yourself an excuse for why you can't. My boss is too stupid. I'm, I'm not senior enough, uh, and whatever. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, my what I thought was going to be a 30 second conclusion is a little bit longer than that. It's extraordinary how many people think that they are the only ones that can understand the the, the common sense of what I presented today. Right? Uh, even your boss can understand. I think, okay, um, don't think you're the only ones who can understand this thing. It's just because it's, it's both common sense and counterintuitive in many ways. Uh, it takes some, some talking to get it done, but it, it's working like this. And what's uh, more important is it, it's, it's, it's more and more like this. I repeat, the theory constraints are just getting more and more pertinent as the world goes down to where it's going in terms of uh, uncertainty. Um, and therefore, uh, capacity is badly distributed and having bottlenecks, often bad bottlenecks. So this thing is, is, is getting more and more pertinent. Uh, we, we've been swamped uh, by work because of, of COVID because it, it can produce uh, very, very fast results. And that's what everybody's looking for right now. I, mean, I need to multiply by 15 the production of this uh, diagnostic machine by this, uh, by 10 the, the number of masks and all that stuff. A theory of constraints is made for that because it produces results at lightning speed, as you can see. So that was my uh, not very short conclusion. Please, please just go away and do it. Thank you very much. Bye bye.